everybody. Um, first of all, uh, today is World Food Day. We're starting this webinar series, and I'm very happy to be with uh, Amir Kassam and Leila Kassam and all of you know the people joining. Um, so first things first, um, I'm Nassim Nobari, the director of Seed the Commons. For those of you who are not familiar with Seed the Commons, we are a small grassroots organization that's based in San Francisco. Um, we address, we try to address the root causes of social injustice, environmental degradation through the radical transformation of our food systems. And we do that in various ways. Um, one of the main ways that we do that is by building public awareness around these issues on the importance of food, how to transform our food systems, what are the main issues. So we do events, conferences, this sort of thing. Um, although this particular type of webinar is our first. So, um, you know, that's see the comments. Today for World Food Day, we're starting this webinar series called Rethinking Food and Agriculture in a Time of COVID and Climate Change. I'd like to encourage you all to make a small donation to support this webinar series. The information to donate is on the Zoom regis uh, registration link. Um, all right, so I'm first going to introduce the speakers, and then we'll speak a little bit about the book, get into the topics, and so on. So Amir Kassam is visiting professor in the School of Agriculture, Policy, and Development at the University of Reading, UK, where he teaches agriculture and development. He is the moderator of the FAO-hosted Global Platform for Conservation, Agriculture, Community of Practice and Chairman of the International Conservation Agriculture Advisory Panel for Africa. Born in Tanzania, Amir has a BSc in Agriculture, a PhD in Agricology, and an MSc in Irrigation. Amir is a Fellow of the Royal Society of Biology in the UK. He has published widely. In 2005, Amir was awarded an OBE in the Queen's Honours List for services to tropical agriculture and to rural development. Amir's former positions include Deputy Director General at the Africa Rice Center, CGIR, CGIAR, Interim Executive Secretary of the CGIAR Science Council, and the Chairman of the Aga Khan Foundation in the UK, Focus Humanitarian Assistance Europe Foundation, and Tropical Agriculture Association UK. So a lot of experience, <laughs> a lot of expertise. Leila Kassam, um, is the co-founder of Animal Think Tank UK. Um, she is a development economist and has worked in the international development uh, world since 2003. She has worked in, with NGOs, foundations, government and ministries, and international research and development institutions, including the CGIAR and FAO, focusing on rural development in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Layla is a co-founder and joint mission coordinator of Animal Think Tank UK. She currently works on issues related to food system transformation and animal, climate, and social justice. Layla Kassam has a BSc in Economics and Politics from the University of Bristol, an MSc in Development Management, and a PhD in Development Economics from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. Layla's previous positions include Program Associate for Rural Development for the Aga Khan Foundation, Research Officer for the DFID-funded Coastal Rural Support Program in Kenya, and Overseas Development Institute Fellow at the Ministry of Agriculture of Guyana. All right. Um, I'll just repeat quickly what I said about uh, the, you know, kind of the uh, question stuff. Um, we will do a Q&A session. It will be at the end. You can ask questions in the Q&A window. Um, you can save your questions for the end. If you really feel motivated to post it before, that's fine. I'll be covering, I'll be keeping an eye on that. Um, and then there's also the chat where you can comment to each other, but um, questions are best posted in the Q&A thing. All right. So Leila and Amir, thank you so much for joining me. Welcome. Happy World Food Day. Um, all right, so we're here because not only it's World Food Day and not only we're starting this series, but you are both the editors of a book that's being published on October 31st. Um, the book is titled Rethinking Food and Agriculture, New Ways Forward. What you've written about this book is 
Um, given the central role of food and agriculture system in driving so many of the interconnected ecological, social, and economic crises we, crises we, we currently face, Rethinking Food and Agriculture reviews, reassesses, and reimagines the current food and agriculture system and the narrow paradigm in which it operates. So what I first want to ask you is um, why this book at this time? Okay, so I'm not sure exactly how intentional we were about producing this book at this particular time. It's been, you know, many years in the making, really. Um, you know, we've been thinking about and working on issues, as you've heard in our bios, for, you know, around food, agriculture, food security, poverty, for, you know, for me, for like 15 years, for my dad, for so much longer. And also, you know, engaging with like-minded colleagues, who, you know, really trying to understand, you know, what, what, what is going on and what are the root causes of what we're seeing, all these connected crises. Um, and, you know, my father and I have quite complementary expertise and experience, but it was only really a few years ago that there seemed to be an opportunity to bring that expertise and different perspectives together. Um, I think my father was finishing um, a three volume book series on conservation agriculture, where he was really questioning um, the dominant green revolution industrial agriculture paradigm. And at that time, I was deeply questioning the development industry that I had been, you know, had my career in and so much so that I, I decided to leave. Um, and was also becoming more involved in, in animal liberation and environmental issues. And, you know, we saw all of these is issues as connected. Um, and so around that time, my father was approached by Elsevier to co-edit, oh no, sorry, to edit a book on responsible agricultural intensification. And he asked me to co-edit it with him. And I said, yes, but um, let's make it really broad um, and, and really look at the structural drivers of, of the industrial agriculture paradigm, because, you know, from, from both our perspectives, having having a, a, a beautiful transformation in the agriculture paradigm without looking at those broader issues um, didn't seem like it was a, like a holistic kind of comprehensive approach. Um, so yeah, about two and a half years ago, we sat down and we wrote a proposal, basically, I think in essence for the book that we wanted to read that actually tried to connect so many of the issues that we were thinking about um, and that included all of these issues and root causes in the solutions that were being put forward. Um, and you know we've, we feel so fortunate because we've been able to bring together so many amazing, insightful, experienced, progressive authors, including you, Nassim. Um, your chapter is just brilliant in the book. Um, and, and you know, yeah, the book just represents so much experience and insight um, about all of these issues and how we can address them. Um, and so when we think about what's happened, I mean, this year, 2020, my God, we've got COVID and, you know, increasing, really increasing awareness around um, our, the climate and ecological emergencies. It feels even more timely, but like, we can't take credit for the timing. I think the timing worked for us in terms of, you know, the, ma the maturation of our ideas and, and having the capacity to actually focus on something as big as this. Um, yeah. I, I would just like to add one more thing, and that is that the dimensions of uh, uh, connections between uh, uh, food, agriculture, and human health was another driving element here as well, uh, which uh, uh, was of, of uh, interest to actually Leila's two other sisters, and they have actually contributed a, a chapter on, on the connection between uh, um, our our uh, health and the, the the basically the the industrial food regime, which is now leading to so much uh, uh, problems. All right, thank you. Um, so before we get into more detail around the book, um, well, today's World Food Day, as I've said, and this is the occasion that we chose to launch this webinar series. Um, and both of you have very specific backgrounds. You both work in, have worked in rural development, you're agricultural experts, and that's um, in a way kind of niche. I think that some of the people listening are not at all from that background. Um, and so what I want to ask is why 
should food, you know, why does food matter and why should it matter to everybody? You know, is this a topic that is really only for people who work in your field or is this a topic for everybody? And if so, why? Um, food, food, of course, at the basic level, uh, it's, it's, it's our, or it's the simplest level, it is our basic human need uh, and, uh, and increasingly it is being considered as our right and we need healthy and nutritious, uh, nutritious food, uh, not just to survive, but to thrive uh, socioculturally as well as uh, uh, economically. Uh, but having said that, currently we should be fully aware that four billion, four billion people uh, remain in, 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 uh, in, in poverty uh, and are not really getting uh, adequate uh, food, uh, both in amount and quality, uh, and two billion people uh, are uh, in, uh, chronically hungry, and this is this is more than ever before, uh, and this is unacceptable from an ethical uh, viewpoint, uh, especially when you consider that we are producing enough food to, to feed uh, 10, 10 uh, billion people. Uh, and at the same time, in, especially in the industrialized, industrialized countries, we've got two billion uh, adults who are overweight uh, and uh, um, more and more, uh, almost uh, three quarter of a million, uh, 650 uh, million people are now uh, obese. And the predictions are that this is just going to continue to be, to go worse if we're not careful. Uh, about what we uh, eat. And this is very, very uh, clearly uh, uh, described in the Lancet Commission on Obesity report. The, they, they say that this syndemic of obesity, undernutrition and climate change represent the most urgent challenge for humans, uh, uh, the environment and, and, and in fact, the, the planet. Uh, food, what we eat and how we produce and process it is very central to all this. The way our food and agriculture system is going, it seems incapable of providing healthy, nutritious food for all. It is destroying uh, uh, now, as I mentioned, human health uh, um, um, alongside uh, destroying the planetary health. An unhealthy so-called industrialized diet, or especially the Western diets, uh, are, are so highly based on animal flesh and animal secretions and 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 then on top of that uh, processed food uh, which are which uh, and degrading an increasingly industrial production system that they cause such negative impact on our health environment and people's livelihood as well because that system is not really inclusive and it is marginalizing uh, uh, um, for example smallholders and other rural people uh, and in, in many, many, many ways, uh, whether we realize it or not, and we have not, uh, we have not to only consider food to be important for human beings, but we must also ensure that it is available and produced uh, in a in a sustainable manner, which uh, means causing less or least damage. Uh, uh, in fact, quite op opposite, it could be enhancing of the environment and uh, in our health. So th those are the reasons why food must be considered uh, very important. And of course, <laughs> we know that we have to uh, eat it three times a day. And, and, uh, uh, and so this is, this is a very uh, integral part of our daily life and, 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 and many cultures uh, um, consider food as, 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 a, as a gift of uh, nature and, 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 and the creation. So it has also a, a very intimate uh, spiritual value to, to many people. Yeah. That's <laughs> Leila, were you going to add something? I, I couldn't. No, no, I just, I mean, I think, I think what um, my father has said is it, it covers it. I mean, I think, um, you know, something that I just, you know, that's happening in the UK right now, for example, is like the MPs have, have um, voted against an, an amendment in the House of Lords to actually maintain like our food standards after Brexit. And it's like, you know, the, the sort of stuff around chlorinated chicken coming in and what have you. I mean, this is just a, 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 a tiny example of how, you know, if we're not, if we're not careful and if we are not aware about our food system, we are not going to have a choice and we're just going to end up eating 
being, you know, being given basically just the most horrendous quality of food, um, which is, you know, going to impact us. So whether we realise it or not, we have to care. Or oh, it's important to all of us. So that's just, I just wanted to add that. And 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 I think just one more. I just um, I just remembered. And of course, we our food system, uh, while food is such a basic right. Uh, we we now find that we are we are wasting <laughs> wasting uh, thirty percent of the food produced, and this is a colossal amount. Uh, in addition to uh, wasting resources uh, while to produce it, and and uh, and that could be uh, in an equitable world, uh, a lot of that would be uh, distributed more more. Uh, 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 equally and 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 in fact in fact uh, most of most of the so called increases in food we we now need uh, because we somehow lacking and all that you know i mean if we start controlling the waste we we we, we would be on on our way to meeting um uh, food requirement of uh, of 2050 and uh, so that's another 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 element which is essentially coming in from our corporate food mentality now and, and supermarket, which will only, for example, uh, uh, ensure that a carrot gets through a, through a, 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 a beauty parade or an apple has to have a certain character, which, uh, so that, that's uh, happening now so much. And then our eating habits and the packaging and all those things are just, uh, um, um, you know, uh, putting more and more pressure on, on, our, on our resources. So, um, you know, Seed the Commons was not founded by people who had any real background in anything related to agriculture or even development. Um, and so we started focusing on food systems, not because that happened to be, you know, a particular area of interest, to be honest but rather because you know our backgrounds as activists was more in the anti-globalization movement and the anti-war movement and so the focus on food really came from that where it was like well if we're talking about um opposing war we need to be changing you know the economic model that's producing the war if we're talking about you know the harms of globalization it's really about land and so on so you know, so I completely agree that these things are, are completely central and that's how we came to it. It was more of this process of saying, well, the things that we care about, if we want to get to the root causes of them, it brings us to issues of land and food and, and these things. And so, um, you know, this year with COVID and climate change, I mean, climate change has been something that people have been speaking about more and more for the past few years. And then now we also have COVID. And I think that, um, you know, there have been efforts in both cases to show the connections between food systems and these particular issues or certain aspects of our food systems. Some people focus more on industrial agriculture, some people on animal agriculture, but there, you know, there has been some of that. And for Seed the Commons, it's really been clear that we generally came from the sense of, okay, food is central, but now this year that's all the more apparent with these two very urgent things that are happening. You know, we're in California with the wildfires that are obviously linked to climate change. Um, so I know that this is a very broad question and I know that you've already touched upon it a little bit, but um, you know, the title of the series is Rethinking Food and Agriculture in a Time of COVID and Climate Change because we wanted to express that urgency of rethinking food and agriculture. And I wanted to ask if you could address a little bit the connections between our current food regime and the public health challenges that we're facing and the environmental challenges that we're facing. Excellent question, Nassim. This, this question basically uh, uh, highlights to me and to Leila uh, and to many colleagues of ours, uh, it's highlighting the the the, the uh, this is the global the burden the the, the burden of global uh, challenges we are we are carrying now. So it, it's not uh, 
uh, not uh, one or two things here and there, or we can then say, well, in a fragmented way, or let's, let's attack, uh, or let's uh, look at uh, animal agriculture, or let's look at uh, uh, um, food processing, or uh, the whole, the, the whole uh, set of these uh, global burden, ecological, uh, climate emergencies, environmental degradation, pandemic, which you just mentioned, as well as this growing inequality, or I would say very per pervasive and growing uh, inequality in the society, and then uh, con uh, continuing hunger uh, and, 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 and some very deep poverty uh, in, in many, many areas. Uh, and now obesity, the increase in uh, um, rise in non-communicable diseases uh, going rampant. Uh, now, we, these are not really separate issue. Uh, um, and, and we see them, we see them uh, as, uh, as uh, not interconnected for sure. Uh, and the role of the food and agriculture system, or what we, uh, in fact, uh, what uh, we have been referring to as the corporate food regime, is central to them all. And, and the corporate food regime mentality has, has permeated, um, I'm sorry to say this, but it has permeated into our knowledge system, in, into, into, into the the very institution which are supposed to, uh, to um, uh, keep an eye on knowledge, generate more and more evidence-based information and, and transmit that to, through our educational institutions, through other uh, channels. Unfortunately, um, these have um, uh, somehow uh, have, um, uh, have been increasingly finding that they are disconnected uh, and then what has happened, uh, the public health uh, issues, that the public is now disconnected. Uh, and, uh, and for some 30 years, uh, I, I could recall uh, puzzling that why is farming so, uh, so difficult to, to understand? Uh, and the farmers uh, have increasingly got connected, uh, have basically been driven uh, by, by not by science and, and ecology and their understanding of how their, uh, their, uh, their uh, processes of plant growth, plant management, uh, uh, resilience, how do they work? Why, why has this uh, been lost over, over time? And then when uh, looking at the education system, I've been teaching for many, 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 many years. And, and, uh, and I'm, I'm absolutely shocked that we now have a situation where um, um, education is going one way, uh, our interests are going the other way, the, the food regime is taking the public into another way, and, and, and same thing, uh, the health, uh, uh, that, that medicine is, is taking, uh, taking treatments into, into a direction which is opposite to, to what we, you and I would uh, want to see in terms of uh, 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 lifestyle and and, uh, and and so forth. So we we are um, in a in a in a situation where all these things are interconnected. And at the core, at the core of all this, of course, at the core uh, lies uh, our effort to produce the food in the first place. And that effort uh, has now gone so destructive. Uh, uh, and and. Uh, um, and I mean, the sort of land use change, for example, mainly uh, land conversion for crop culti cultivation. Um, it's now become so degrading. For example, since the World War, War I, uh, not only have we, have we been driven by corporate sector increasingly uh, through, through this uh, uh, paradigm, which is, which is essentially uh, in the early days, it used to be given a name called Green Revolution. But we, it, it, it wasn't really green in, in, in the sense that it was going to look after the earth. It was, it was put there to fight the red revolution. 
uh, of the Russians. And, and so the name came, well, we must, must uh, oppose it by all means, uh, including wars, and, and, uh, but, but also <laughs> agriculture became uh, 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 driven by corporate sector because it became the part of it, the food became in some of the, some of the countries, they became a, a very important element of their foreign policy. And that industrial revolution today now uh, has become so intensive, uh, reliant on excessive agrochemicals, fossil fuel, uh, and monocultural systems uh, uh, or poor diversification uh, that it is now driving much of, much of the destruction in the cropping area, in the crop area. Um, but then you also have side by side the whole area of animal agriculture, uh, which uh, has equally gone forward in many ways in the, uh, taken the industrialized route. And that um, um, uh, the public uh, again uh, has been kept ignorant. Uh, our um, education system doesn't reveal everything. Uh, uh, and, and for example, that animal uh, agriculture today now to deliver the, uh, the, the un, sort of unlimited desire of our public to, uh, to eat, eat meat, uh, it, kills, it kills 70 billion land animals. And it, it kills another two trillion aquatic creatures just so that we, we can, uh, uh, you know, uh, but then what happens at the, at the, at the land level the, the, that this has now ended up occupying uh, over 80% of our agricultural land, over 80% of agricultural land today is allocated for livestock production which only produces, in fact, less than 20% of our calorie needs. And this means that uh, that, that area, that area, you know, it, 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 it's a huge area. It, it, it's about uh, it, it's a, it's a 3.5 billion hectares at the global level. And that, that, uh, that basically, in, 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 in many ways, of course, it, it is, uh, uh, um, it, it, is, it is not accessible for decent policy planning. It is not accessible in many cases uh, uh, for land use planning for, for common good because a lot of that area, um, uh, partly of course it is legacy from, from the colonial days uh, when livestock production was used to colonize and, 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 and uh, marginalize indigenous people and including including in the western world many 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 people here got marginalized got kicked out of europe uh, by 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 laws like enclosure laws and and, uh, and grabbing the public resources but those resources resource grabbing eventually and then this is still happening it's not just over it's still happening like in the amazon areas and and so forth uh, it uh, it is it has basically um, uh, destroyed our 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 uh, ability to even uh, plan uh, um, uh, optim op optimum land use, uh, destroying our forest biodiversity, and it keeps the degraded area in those conditions. And, and, and then to say that, oh, we're gonna sequester uh, carbon with, with this, this animal and, and, and it is gonna uh, give you uh, some manure, um, uh, most, most, uh, most of our agricultural is not connected to livestock uh, 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 farming. It is on its own, uh, and and so as I said, more than eighty percent of the area, and uh, and that also has driven many, many indigenous people uh, into 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 homelessness, and and uh, uh, and and also all the while causing this incredible suffering to to uh, to uh, non-human animals. And, and of course, I, I, I think it is now uh, um, fully supported by lots and lots of evidence. Our agricultural system, and especially in the crop areas, uh, um, the fact that you, it destroys soil health and soil function, that means that the soil can no longer uh, be part of the soil mediated water cycling. And what we get is the water can't penetrate, penetrate into the soil. And then we have, uh, uh, now we have very high, uh, very high, um, uh, what you call it, uh, um, uh, not only soil destruction, but, but high 
uh, frequ um, increased frequencies and intensity of flooding. And that causes uh, uh, enormous damage, uh, uh, social damage, infrastructure damage, economic damage, uh, and, and, and all that, um, you know, um, is on top of all the deforestation, which is, the, which is happening, uh, which is actually driven by livestock uh, uh, expansion. In fact, you know, the other day I was reading a report, some of the, the, the animal agriculture, for example, which is, which is uh, um, uh, causing deforestation uh, in the Amazon, turns up in London so that they could eat a, eat a, eat a, a hamburger for less than a dollar, uh, you know, and, but they don't, the people who keep eating uh, these things don't even know that this has vast environmental cost, but the human cost out there, uh, uh, indigenous communities are struggling to survive. And, and, and now if this continues that we are basically facing not only ecological collapse, but, but societal collapse uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the near future. And, uh, and unfortunately, you know, the soil erosion uh, part of, of agriculture is, is, <laughs> is leading, it is leading to loss of 25 billion uh, tons of topsoil. I mean, this is topsoil going into, 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 into oceans uh, and creating, has created, uh, uh, along with agrochemicals, it has created 400 aquatic dead zones already. And and uh, and many many dead zones underneath in the in the because of the pollution of of groundwater systems. So so I think I think we we have to uh, begin to become fully aware uh, that while we need and we need food, but uh, but the, now the the driving forces are basically uh, uh, it's like cutting our uh, cutting our own feet, uh, and we must uh, must uh, begin to. Uh, understand why, and therefore we can then uh, respond to it uh, in a, in a more democratic and sensible sensible way. So yeah, I mean, I I feel like most of these points could be the topic of a whole webinar on their own. And we are actually going to try to do kind of, you know, that with future webinars um, because there are so many ways in which I liked the image of cutting off our feet and there's so many ways in which, you know, removing the basis that we need or messing with the basis is affecting all the rest. Um, I am going to come back to that a little bit, but I wanted to just you know, since you were speaking about a bit of, you know, how the cropping and livestock and so on, um, I wanted to invite you guys to address, you know, or name some of the most important flaws in our current dominant agricultural model. Um, and what are the changes that you are proposing in this book? I mean, I assume we can't get to everything, but in the dominant models, like what are the, the, the practices, the paradigms, et cetera, that you see as flawed and what's your vision um, in regards to agriculture specifically? I mean, do you want to answer this thing as you're the sustainable agriculture expert? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, um, I, I think uh, on, the, um, on, the on the agricultural side, uh, I, uh, what, uh, what uh, basically um, uh, must change is, is having realized what, what so-called uh, the Green Revolution paradigm is now doing. Uh, and, and it flows uh, now, I think I've described uh, uh, already, uh, and it's not just the green revolution. I think that the, most of our diseases uh, ha are arising out of the way uh, we we manage uh, uh, animal agriculture. I, I don't think Leila or I mentioned uh, the industrial animal agriculture. I mean, mo most of our diseases, uh, uh, all the SARS, for example, <laughs> the uh, 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 zoonotic diseases are, are turning up from from agricultural sources or from from mistreatment of animals and confining them in uh, for using them when when the, when they their their uh, 
their relationship with their viruses uh, are are constrained and and uh, and they the viruses start uh, uh, mutating and then we we then uh, you know uh, get those but in terms of uh, and in in terms of uh, uh, the current paradigm I, I think also people need to realize that we have now lost about half a billion hectares from this so-called our our um, uh, modern agriculture uh, since uh, since the World War II actually uh, and and th this um, uh, means of production which we we would refer to as sort of highly mechanical and highly chemically disturbing agriculture uh, uh, is is just not on, and and we we need to now begin to move uh, more and more into solutions which are biologically based, but also ecologically sound. Uh, that means that 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 the production system, for example, the current ones, don't have any ecological underpinnings. In other words, like a house with no foundation, and it keeps. Uh, 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 yeah, and uh, and we, uh, the corporate sector keeps coming up with new gadgets, new new promises, and and uh, and but it, it doesn't really um, add anything to the science of what we would call the the, the ecology of agriculture uh, or the ecology of conservation. Uh, it's a science of conservation in 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 agriculture. So we uh, uh, must now begin to. Uh, uh, realize that that uh, the new agriculture must have, uh, uh, be based on uh, on ecologically sound foundation and 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 uh, emulate nature as much as possible. So, for example, in the book we we analyze uh, the different paradigms of agriculture, and we show uh, uh, that that alternative agriculture, in fact, all of them. The alternative agriculture, they, all of them claim that they they uh, have uh, uh, it's, um, uh, ecology at heart, and in fact, one of the paradigm calls itself agroecology with a capital A. Um, and then there is uh, the the most, uh, I think, the most uh, uh, forward uh, uh, moving paradigm is is what is referred to as conservation agriculture. Uh, which is the the no-till agriculture system, which has been evolving for last 50 years, uh, uh, and and since uh, for the last 30 years, that's really taken off globally, uh, and it it is based, it is underpinned ecologically in the following way, with three three uh, principles which are applied uh, in an interconnected way. First is you avoid or minimize mechanical disturbance of the soil. So you constantly are leaving the soil alone like, like nature does. Nature doesn't go around with a big uh, weapon of mass destruction like a plow. Uh, it, 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 uh, it leaves the soil alone and it, it uh, lets biology work on the soil. So the second, uh, and, and remain protected. Uh, uh, the soil, wherever there's water and vegetation is growing, nature protects the soil surface by having a, a, a layer of mulch, uh, a permanent layer of mulch uh, uh, on, on the soil surface. Uh, and so that is the second principle uh, of the new, what we would call the new uh, sustainable uh, agriculture to keep the soil covered. And that cover is not a plastic cover or some, some, some magical industrial product. It is basically plant biomass produced from nature uh, uh, and that would be from the cropping system itself. It doesn't need any manure it, it, because manure is plant biomass pushed through, a, through an animal's gut. It, it can do the job uh, through earthworms quite well. So we, uh, and the third principle is that we go, go back to our, our understanding of biodiversity. So the third uh, interlinked principle of uh, um, a sustainable agriculture in conservation agriculture is species diversification. The three of these principles, when they are applied, give the, a solid foundation to any land-based agriculture. And then, and then uh, Nassim, if we are then uh, uh, want to link it to a, to a sustainable food system, then we are then begin to talk about how do we uh, manage that part so that we are 
as kind as possible to, to the natural world, to our animal uh, uh, kins, and and uh, and so we begin to understand uh, that 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 part uh, has to be uh, not only agroecological part, but but you're faced with an ethical decision here, an ethical decision which now no longer uh, should um, force people to just chop the head off uh, of a, of a, of a of an animal without understanding the full, full, um, what I would call uh, the full unethical system which supports that agriculture. Uh, and, uh, and just to give you one example, I mean, if you keep want to promote milk uh, 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 all the time, uh, uh, today now a cow, a poor cow, has to carry a completely, completely synthetic udder, which has to hold up to 10 gallons of milk. You try and walk around just with, with two gallons of water in a, in a, in a container for, for, for half an hour, and you're gonna get tired. Just imagine, just imagine that you are being asked to carry an udder, which will be filled with 40 to 50 or more liters of milk continuously, every day. The cow can't stand anymore, it has to sit down. And uh, so these are the things which, uh, uh, and it happens across all the, all the poultry and all the, all the other animals. So we have, we have a system which is uh, even ethically not, not uh, 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 functioning properly. And then the, of course the benefits of CA, which I started describing, but then there are uh, wonderful benefits to the in, to environment because it is regenerative. So we need to start restoring and, be on a self repair uh, into a self repair system self protecting system because it has lots of lots it brings back a lot of biodiversity which starts taking care of uh, crop health uh, in the soil all the biodiversity gets back soil health is looked after but most importantly to a farmer it is much uh, uh, cheaper to 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 uh, to manage and the cost are uh, much less or more, less than less less than current sort of uh, cost of about less than fifty percent or even more depending on how how biologically you you are able to go and we are now making tremendous progress in this system and then we have a system which is sequestering carbon and not emitting carbon it is keeping our water system uh, clean and and so we have we have really um, a system which uh, uh, not only um, it, it gives you all those benefits, but most importantly, it does not marginalize the smallholder. It is suitable for smallholder and they can do it uh, with minimum, minimum uh, financial liability uh, and, and, uh, and so forth. And ultimately, uh, as I said, the closer we, the most we move towards uh, minimizing livestock uh, intake, we are then moving towards uh, another kind of diet, but it is more than just another kind of diet. I think that what we are talking about, appreciating nature itself and our role in, in really um, um, acting as stewards of nature rather than, than, than destroyer of nature. At the moment, I'm, I'm pleased to say of all the alternate uh, um, paradigms like agroecology or 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 uh, organic um, uh, uh, conservation agriculture occupies already some 200 million hectares, about uh, uh, 14, 15 percent of the of the uh, uh, annual cropping area, and more and more now perennial systems, uh, orchards, uh, plantation. They are now moving into this. Uh, and the system and they are realizing that they can now start talking about natural farming, zero budget farming and, and, and so forth. So, so this, this is the new, new paradigm which we favor, but recognizing there are other, other uh, paradigms being, being moved forward. And what we, Leila and I are hoping in this book is that we will show them that these paradigms are borrowing from each other 
And in fact, one recently has borrowed everything from conservation agriculture and has superimposed a new name, regenerative agriculture, and now is beginning to use that, misuse that term. Uh, and, and it's confusing everybody uh, uh, in every way. But conservation agriculture is the one to keep your eye on and it's, it's a basic ecological foundation and all the biological processes which, uh, which it uh, energizes and, 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 and rehabilitates. Yeah, yeah I, I would just like to add to that. So uh, um, one of the, I suppose one of the things that we did in the chapter that my father and I wrote on paradigms of agriculture, which was to look at these alternate paradigms, and I suppose try and have a, I guess, a synthesis maybe, or of like, of, of the best parts of, of the different paradigms. Um, and so I think to, at the end of the book, I think we, especially thinking about ethics and, and also, um, you know, addressing issues of, of the corporate food regime and realizing that we have to be part, whatever paradigm has to be part of the sort of anti-capitalist, anti-corporate food regime, uh, be able to integrate into those struggles. So we are promoting an, a sort of synthesis of conservation agriculture based veganic agroecology and agroecology with a capital L as a science of practice and a movement. Um, so that's kind of a sort of more holistic, I guess, um, but based on the ecological underpinnings of conservation agriculture, which not all agroecology, um, you know, systems would be um, because of tillage and, and those sorts of things. So, yeah. All right, I can then unmute myself for a second. Um, okay, excellent. I want to continue in a minute on um, the things you brought up regarding ecological farming, um, you brought up some, you know, different ideas surrounding animal agriculture. I want to get into that in a minute. And also, um, people have been asking some pretty good questions. So I also want to have the time to get to those questions, um, which we will do. Um, but I think here's maybe a good you know, time to ask, one of the things that you speak about in the book is inclusive responsibility. What does that mean? Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. So um, inclusive responsibility is an ethical framework, basically, based on universal values such as inclusion, interdependence, pluralism, justice, equity and care. Um, which in, you know, at the end of the book, we argue should guide our transformation of the food and agriculture system. Um, and we came up with this because I think we really realized that these multiple crises that we are facing, yes, it's about the corporate food regime and capitalism and all sorts of, uh, you know, industrial agriculture, but it ultimately to us um, reflects an underlying crisis of ethics and values. So if we think about um, you know, our economic system, which is a huge driver of these crises, you know, the sort of values or principles that it's based on, it values competition and individualism and colonization and racism and patriarchy and, and extraction. And I could just go on and on and on about, you know, all the ills. Um, and I think we really felt that if we want systemic solutions to the root causes, then we need to build alternatives to the current destructive system. And whatever systems we create have to be underpinned by an ethical framework of responsibility um, aligned with universal human values. Otherwise, we'll just keep reproducing the same problems. Um, and so um, we, you know, in the book, we, we sort of try and distill some of the really key themes that the, the chapters were putting forward in terms of new ways forward. And we use those themes um, to kind of inform what, you know, along with the, the sort of the ethical values that I just talked about to kind of come up with some principles, I suppose, or considerations for what an inclusively responsible food and agriculture paradigm would look like. I mean, in, in our mind, we could have, you know, an inclusively responsible any kind of system, but, you know, in terms of a food and agriculture system, and we came up with, you know, six considerations or principles um, that this paradigm should be ecologically sustainable and multifunctional. 
um, that it needs to be relevant to smallholders and their innovation and development strategies, um, that it needs to, this paradigm needs to be able to meet the, the need for sustainable and healthy whole food plant-based diets, um, that it needs to be able to integrate into the wider movements, um, resisting the corporate food regime, um, fighting for local autonomy, for land justice, seed justice, um, and food sovereignty. Um, this paradigm needs to respect and protect the rights of all sentient beings, both human and non-human, um, and you know, to live free from human oppression and exploitation and harm. And finally, um, an inclusively responsible food and agriculture paradigm would respect and protect the rights, rights of nature based on an ethic of care towards the earth. Um, and so, you know, we, we've used sort of inclusive response, well, in, based on those principles, then we sort of thought one possible vision for a paradigm of food and agriculture would be this CA-based veganic agroecology. It kind of ticks all of those boxes. Um, and, you know, we, we use the idea of inclusively because we want, we want it to be applied inclusively to humans, other animals, the planet at every level of the food and agriculture system. And we also wanted to highlight our individual and collective responsibility, a bit like your first question, you know, why should food matter to, to all, well, does food matter to all of us or why should it? It should. And, and, and we all have a collective responsibility um, to contribute to changing this system because we need it. We need a healthy functioning food system for us to live and continue living and thriving on, on this planet. Um, so yeah, that's what inclusive responsibility is. And we, it's an offering, I suppose, of one guiding sort of vision um, for, for people who, are, who want a more sustainable and just food and agriculture system and ultimately world. Yeah, I, I could just add one more point. And that is that, that this framework um, is not uh, excluding anybody. Anybody, wherever they are, they can basically move forward. Uh, but but in, integrating some of these key elements would automatically help them to converge towards a common public goal. And that is, that is to me, important at every individual level, uh, uh, because many people uh, um, are confused about what's happening and what information they are getting, and and but and so how do we find our way forward? Secondly, at the corporate level, I uh, you know you would you would say to the corporate sector that we know you are you have the potential to contribute to society, but let's stop this unfair competition and fight. Everybody or work with everybody on equal grounds, and 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 uh, and if you're so so interested in servicing uh, human beings and and remain compatible with nature, fine, produce ecologically sound products, and and see who will buy your product. But uh, to try and keep uh, half the world's population poor. Uh, and 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 uh, concentrating power and, and wealth all the time into some some few hands. We've now also turned the world into into a, into a plutoc plutocracy, uh, and uh, and only those people with the money talks. And uh, so this inclusive responsibility has that sort of implicit goal that we uh, we can create moving forward a more level level uh, playing field and uh, small and the large. Can, and just will give you one example. Lula did this in Brazil. When Lula became president, he opened up the second Ministry of Agriculture. He didn't just say to the Ministry of Agriculture that you have a special unit now focusing on the smallholder and just spend few, you know, and, and make sure I earn votes. No, he opened a full, full-fledged second ministry for for smallholder. And overall, he said, we are now not going to aim at zero hunger. We, we will now have a policy of eliminating hunger, eradicating hunger. And what do you have now? You know, and you will discover in Brazil, there are 25% of the, the farmers are smallholders. They're not all bigger, but at least they were accommodated within the overall 
uh, framework. And so wherever you go, you find farmers organizations uh, uh, with small and large farmers and all of them doing ecologically sound uh, uh, farming, uh, which of course the government also has promoted alongside. Yeah, I want to, um, you know, I want to explore more this question of wealth inequality and concentration of wealth. Um, I don't know that we have a lot of time to get into that today because it's almost um, 11 or 7 p.m. for you. Um, but, you know, but if not, you know, that's a big part of it. Uh, during the pandemic, especially, we've seen even more concentration of wealth and billionaires getting even more wealthy. And I think that reclaiming our food systems and the natural resources that make up those food systems is really part of addressing that. Um, I just don't know if we have time to get into that in a lot of detail today, but just, you know, I think that we will get into that in more detail in future webinars. Um, so sign up for a newsletter. <laughs> but uh, you, you both spoke a little bit about, um, you know, a few things that I want to come back to, uh, because what you're talking about inclusive responsibility is really completely revolutionary. I mean, I don't think it sounds, <laughs> I don't think it sounds like that when people just hear the title, they're probably like, oh, okay, inclusive, you know, everybody talks about that. But you're including um, non-human animals in that inclusivity. And that is revolutionary. And you're speaking about veganic agroecology. So, so I want to explore that a little bit. Um, Amir, you spoke a few times about factory farms, but you also mentioned um, the loss of topsoil that we're seeing. So I think that, you know, by now a lot of people are well versed in the problem of factory farms, at least that factory farms are in some way a problem. But simultaneously, we're seeing um, a lot of discourse precisely around the fact that we've been using a uh, losing topsoil. And the argument being that to rebuild that topsoil, we need animals in the system, just not the factory farmed animals. So, you know, I, one of the things I, I would like to ask you to address is um, you know, first of all, is this veganic agroecology actually doable everywhere? And then also, um, you know, in terms of the topsoil that we've lost and are losing, what do you make of this argument that grazing livestock is the solution? Um, you spoke about perennial systems and orchards a lot of the regenerative people are speaking precisely of, you know, perennial systems and orchards, and they're kind of demonizing those who grow annuals and saying, well, we need these perennials alongside the livestock. So can you speak a little bit about the feasibility of veganic agroecology and whether um, regenerating soil and ecosystems must include domesticated animals? I mean, it's open to both of you, of course. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, th I think I'm sure Leila would have a few things to say. Um, I think the most simpler way of looking at it is is uh, um, that can can one farm without animals? And uh, and uh, surprisingly, uh, m most of our farming doesn't have animals in them, and uh, and, uh, um, and much of the animals are. are on, on areas which are which are being degraded and have, and, uh, and through mismanagement they are further being degraded but in uh, in uh, first of all in the crop areas in the crop area I, I work with thousands of farmers who have no, have no livestock at all on the farm and uh, and the, and we can we can uh, uh, transform their degrading system uh, plus their own knowledge and, and into into uh, into a very sustainable a soil enhancing soil regenerating system it is uh, because soil is formed the topsoil is formed biologically meaning what it means that the soil microorganisms are allowed to live there normally and their habitats are not destroyed but the point is what do the soil microorganisms live on they live on biomass they live on plant vegetative material. So leaving soil alone 
is not the answer to soil regeneration. The answer is that is the, 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 uh, the organic matter cycling uh, taking place. And the equation is fairly simple. That, uh, that the more diverse soil you want, you, you have to make sure that you have a, have a constant supply of biomass to, to, uh, to, to the soil. So soil, first of all, we need to realize that it doesn't need an animal uh, to, to produce biomass. Biomass can be produced and then in, into the soil, soil organisms uh, are fully capable of, uh, and they demand that if you want my services, please feed me just as you feed yourself. Uh, please feed, feed us here because we have been co-evolved uh, for generations with the plant. And in fact, in fact, the plant feeds us all the time. The plant root system uh, feeds soil, soil microbes. Uh, uh, it, is, it is a bazaar of biodiversity in the soil. Uh, and and uh, uh, so uh, what happens is, is that uh, because we, uh, yeah, under normal circumstances, there will be, of course, uh, mesofauna like your earthworms. Uh, uh, they are great uh, integrator of uh, organic matter into the soil. They do exactly the same job. They, in fact, they, they do, a, to me, they do a better job than a cow would uh, uh, grazing somewhere else or eating, or eating stuff which could be on the soil uh, being, being digested uh, uh, in, uh, by, by microorganisms, including because people argue, oh, well, cows will eat things which nobody can eat. And that's not true. Um, biomass um, um, uh, with, with lignin and cellulose and all that, the, the bi um, earthworms lo love it. I mean, they, they termites would also uh, uh, have a good shop at it. And uh, so uh, earthworms will take uh, um, a lot of them, although in fact, they, they, you, sometimes you'll be amazed how much, how much biomass they would take in, into the soil. Uh, uh, and they work at night, so we don't see them. Uh, and they will in integrate it in the soil. But wh how do they do it? They 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 eat like a cow, with you, uh, like a, um, um, a ruminant cow. This, but they're sitting already in the soil, and they uh, ingest uh, uh, the, the 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 biomass. They add their own uh, mucus and glue gum, and and uh, uh, and then what do they do? They take a piece of a bit of soil and combine it into a nice nice mixture of of uh, of uh, 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 worm cast, it will produce a worm cast, which is a small fertilizer pellet, biologically generated by, and uh, and then in the in the in the in the in the gut, uh, in, in it seems that there are there are nice uh, uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria, and so because, and and the and the earth, uh, earth uh, earthworm worm cast are richer in nitrogen than what they actually ingested. So, uh, we, and you have millions of them in the soil and you don't really need a, an animal to produce a manure. If that is the reason that we, say we should have uh, now, you know, uh, and many people start using that argument with the smallholder, they don't have money to produce uh, and they, they need a, a manure. But I've just described to you that they already have a natural processes ongoing. And, and even in most cases, you don't even have to uh, remove all that biomass and put it into a compost heap because you can leave it on the surface and it will compost on the surface and and you, and, and uh, so so again, th there are things which we uh, are forcing uh, to do, which which are not what necessarily. So the short answer is that you don't need animal uh, to to uh, to uh, support this argument that I need them for sustainability. No, you don't. Uh, many areas are, are very, very fully sustained by nature. They don't have animals, and uh, and thousands and thousands of smallholder I work with. They don't have any animals, and 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 I, I find it it's wrong to even introduce some, uh, animals unnecessarily because they immediately start competing, competing with the very biomass you want to see put back into the soil to maintain soil health, soil function, and soil productivity. So uh, um, that that uh, um, is is my is my answer to uh, uh, to uh, to whether we need. Uh, now, uh, in, in the other part of your question was that we, do we need uh, uh, animals for, 
for uh, soil health regeneration and, and also carbon sequestration. No, we don't. We don't. But that that process can be can be done <laughs> done. Uh, uh, and even if you leave it alone, and if you don't, you can put it back into natural vegetation and and in fact uh, into into rewilding and all those things become possible. Remember, three and a half billion hectares out of our 13 billion world hectare are now, you know, just being being un, unutilized properly and 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 used for for no other than just uh, uh, livestock. And, and most of our livestock <laughs> then uh, feeding the urban areas are also produced from industrialized. Uh, and then that, that manure is, 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 is not only, is not only <laughs> destroying our river systems and, uh, but even including the underground system. So, so I think that we, are, we, we, we uh, are um, uh, uh, not correct when we say that we need, uh, that livestock uh, systems are so, so, so good for sustainability and for climate change. And then of course you have the whole big load of the animal itself contributing uh, uh, methane Methane to to uh, to uh, environment uh, and and each molecule of methane, as you know, is 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 uh, is uh, thirty times more potent than a molecule of carbon dioxide in terms of global warming. I don't know if I have answered the the questions uh, reasonably. I... Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't know if Layla wanted to add something. No, but I did want to um, uh, just remind um, Amir about um, your other question, which was, can veganic agroecology be done everywhere? Because I think that's a really important oh, question, um, which I know he's got a good answer for. Oh, so can agroecology be done everywhere? Veganic, well, ag veganic agroecology. And now, if you mean veganic by, by me, meaning that uh, no livestock, it can be done everywhere. Yes, I, I I don't really see any any absolute reason why you can't practice agriculture. And then you, and if you then say, well, I want to now farm in a veganic way, so that because I'm a, I follow veganism. But you can even go into that. But that's not what we're discussing. But yes, uh, so-called veganic uh, agroecology. Uh, I, I I mean I don't want to make this too heavy. But I mean the Abrahamic literature is very clear. It, say, it says, it says that we have given you animals and creatures, it says, who live like you in, the, in communities and, and be, you are the steward and use them and I've given them to you uh, as, uh, uh, so that they can carry your load. Use them for, for helping you. And it says, do not use them for entertainment. Now, this is this is this is the the, the, the uh, one just one quote in 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 our Abraham, Abrahamic uh, literature. So, so I think, uh, but but at the practical level, uh, if we have to practice uh, veganic agriculture, I uh, agroecology, agroecology, because that's not just any agriculture. It is it is uh, agriculture in harmony with nature. And if nature does it in, in so many places, uh, runs, the, runs, runs the whole uh, ecosystem after ecosystem, uh, it no, no, doesn't ask us to help it. <laughs> it uh, and runs it on a, on a solar energy, on a, on a big solar energy basis, uh, engine basis. So uh, yes, I think in, in, in principle, yes, it can work anywhere for any size of farmers. Uh, it certainly works for very big farmers, and I have I have uh, uh, seen many many. I've worked with thousands of smallholders who are almost starving, are marginalised, and uh, and uh, and um, they've been brought back into into. And and funnily enough, Nasim, funnily enough, <laughs> ten years ago we were doing a pilot scaling in 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 Tanzania. The farmers were running away from their their small holding because they couldn't uh, because the production had gone completely almost kaput and they were looking for off farm work what did we do when we brought conservation agriculture not only within five years they were all back full time they were expanding their agriculture and i sent a student to look at livelihood impact unfortunately they have increased their livestock <laughs> livestock uh, population by 82 percent from a point where they could not even feed themselves, let alone their livestock. 
So we can generate biological products till they come out of our ears. Uh, and and you, 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 and now many of those farm, very farmers are selling, selling biomass to other farmers who are still practicing uh, unecological or non-ecological uh, systems uh, and destroying their soils and not and can't able to regenerate them. Thank you, Leila. So uh, before we open it up to questions, it's getting pretty late. Um, I just have one more question, and this actually relates to one of the questions that somebody is asking in the Q&A. Um, but, you know, so the second part of your book, the title, the first is Rethinking Food and Agriculture. The second part of the title is New Ways Forward. Um, so, you know, uh, what are some of the new ways forward that you're highlighting? And also, um, what are you hoping that your audience will get from this in terms of their own work or behavior or activism? What are some of the, I guess, calls to action or how are you expecting people might be changed or inspired? Yeah. Okay, thanks, Nassim. So, um, I want to before talking about the new ways forward, I just want to kind of, I guess, reframe this, this other part of the book of rethinking. It's actually, you know, it's about new ways of thinking about our challenges. So I think that's, a, that's also really important in terms of thinking about new ways forward, many of which are not new, but, you know, they might be new to us. Um, so, for example, you know, we've got um, a chapter in the book by Rupert Sheldrake, which is which critiques our mechanistic and reductive scientific paradigm and worldview and calls for more holistic ways of understanding the world. I mean, so that's it's kind of deconstructing what's going on. But it, if we actually internalize and shift our our paradigm from this mechanistic, rational, you know, reductive scientific view to a more holistic view, so many different options and new ways forward open up for us. Um, you know, similarly, we've got, you know, a chapter on um, looking at the roots of our dominionist sort of Western agrarian worldview. Again, this is kind of like our, the roots of the, the sort of, you know, the things that we're seeing. Um, we have a chapter on the corporate food regime. So uh, uh, on animal ethics, on, um, you know, our chapter critiques the green revolution paradigm. So I suppose before answering the new ways forward, I just wanted to say that we wanted to have this foundation of really, you know, new ways of thinking about things and deconstructing so that we could then inform, you know, the, the, the new ways forward are, are properly informed, I suppose, with the actual sort of root causes um, of, of the messes that we're in, basically. Um, so we've already talked about, you know, a big chunk of our sort of ideas about new ways forward are to do with alter highlighting alternative paradigms of agriculture. Um, so we've got chapters on agroecology, we've got um, multiple chapters on co that, that talk to um, conservation agriculture and its benefits, including one on soil health um, by David Montgomery, who's the author of the amazing book Dirt, um, and its benefits in, term in terms of climate mitigation. Um, um, and we also have, um, you know, your chapter looks at veganic agroecology. So there's agroecology, CA, veganic agroecology under the umbrella of alternative paradigms for agriculture. But then we also look at um, an alternative paradigm of human nutrition in terms of plant-based diets for human and planetary health. So we've got a brilliant chapter by my brilliant sisters, Shireen and Zara Kassam and their colleagues on plant-based diets and the scientific and clinical evidence underpinning, um, you know, um, the need for plant-based, whole food plant-based diets. And then we've also got chapters looking at the need for seed um, and food sovereignty and agricultural biodiversity. Um, and also, uh, you know, critiquing the role of GMOs in truly ecological and sustainable multifunctional agriculture. Um, we've also got a chapter on what does inclusively responsible knowledge systems look like um, by Robert Chambers, um, you know, so arguing for a better balance between the dominant and local knowledge systems, which can be more holistic and reflective um, in terms of our paradigms and mindsets. Um, 
we've got a chapter looking at localization and not not the kind of you know buy local or eat local but localization as a systemic response to economic globalization and the forces of economic globalization which are so biased towards the large scale and global and so this chapter by Helena Norberg Hodge of Local Futures, you know, she's very well known. It, it, it talks about the ways to like, to just to reverse that sort of trend. So going towards biased again, towards the small scale and the local, um, looking at, you know, tax um, subsidies, um, our free trade agreements and all those mechanisms to, to shift away from sort of, yeah, the forces of globalization, which are really, entangled with, you know, the causes for inequality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we have a chapter on the role of different people and organizations by Tony Juniper. So we've got sort of this broad agriculture, political economy and human nutrition. Those are sort of the three areas. And there's so many that we missed out or we couldn't, you know, we couldn't fit all of it in a book. Like one of the things um, that I really wish that we could have included was this idea of degrowth as well as a kind of um, an alternative or a sort of, we need to think about a post-capitalist society. We also need to understand that growth is like, the, you know, underpins the ideology of capitalism, this infinite gro growth on a finite planet. So we need solutions um, around how to actually reverse this and manage a reduction in our material and energy resource use in a fair and just way. So that would have been a nice extra way forward, but we didn't manage it. Yeah, and, and of course we have a lovely chapter from Nassim, you know, and on uh, you, yeah. you you mentioned that yeah, on uh, several several um, uh, themes, including uh, veganic agroecology, and and also this this uh, complementing. I mean, we have uh, things on 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 the narrative of scarcity, but Nassim brought in the the narrative of abundance, and uh, so that those are, those are very very good. Uh, contributions to, for readers to to think about and and uh, what Leila didn't mention uh, in the right uh, in answer to your first question, actually she had been she had been uh, questioning so many things, and and uh, and and so the book she wanted didn't exist according to her and uh, and she said we must really produce a book which. I could read. I could enjoy reading, and and I think that that what was was our over our overall uh, ambition, and uh, and so so it is filled with new ways forward by every author, every contributor was mm -hmm. was forced to say, look, you know, analysis is fine, it was very important in understanding, but also let's go and say w w which way forward, knowing now if we know this, w w uh, what do we do differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know we're running out of time. I just wanted to add one extra thing. I So many of the books that I've read that deconstruct things so well are just like so poor in terms of actually like what's the solutions. And I know maybe even identifying solutions might be of an old paradigm mindset and there's lots of unknowns, et cetera, et cetera. But I really wanted, well, like we both wanted something really also ultimately. Okay, so what, what are we going to do? Um, so, yeah. So what, yeah. All right, so thank you. I'm going to end this portion of the webinar now, um, and we're going to seek into the Q&A portion. We're already over time, so you know I don't know how much time um, everybody wants to take for the Q&A segment. We already have some questions here, um, and people can post more. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll try to get it to as many as we can. There are some things that um, overlap. Um, and if there are things that we don't get to address, well, why, you know, just write us an email and we'll address them in a future webinar. Um, you know, all right. So, you know, kind of going off on what Layla was just saying, um, Mick has, you know, an interesting question. He's saying, I agree with everything discussed. My concern is how do we educate Johnson, Trump, Bolsonaro, and so many other leaders who are only interested in economic growth? How can, you know, we can change our paradigms all we want. How do we change their paradigms, I guess? Oh, that's the million dollar question. Um, I think from my perspective, um, you know, I'm, I'm really um, sold, I guess, on the idea of, of, of building people power and, and strong social movements. Um, because, 
you know, governments and politicians follow public opinion. So really, I think a big part of our job is to build powerful social movements that understand these issues and can actually shift wider public opinion so that politicians um, are forced to address issues that, they, that they'd rather not. Now, like, it's a massive, massive, massive big task. Um, and it feels really, um, some, some days, like, totally impossible. But I think, for me, um, social movements um, are, are where we need to put a lot of our energy in catalyzing change. Oh, can and I, can I, can, yeah, sorry. I'll just add that there are movements like La Via Campesina and like massive movements that we, that I really feel that we don't know enough about or we, we're so, we've, I, I feel like we're so disconnected. So we, we might be in the animal movement or the, or the, the environmental movement or the food movement. And ultimately, I think we actually, we need to figure out what are, um, where we overlap and there's a lot of overlaps to be able to build the critical mass. And, and, and really support the movements that are actually doing so much of the work on the front lines that we actually, you know, we're not really involved in. And I think, so there's a lot of work for us to do um, in terms of building the power, our collective power. Yeah, and assume, yeah, I would like to add, uh, uh, I think that what the book has also tried to show, um, the totality of the environment within which we're living and change must be, uh, um, move forward. But at the end of the day, um, uh, of course, we want everybody to, to get engaged. Uh, and and the, the, the constraint here is that, you, that engages, engagement is possible once you know what you are talking about. You cannot get engaged out of ignorance or out of annoyance and even anger. Uh, and, 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 and it is very right for people to get angry when they see uh, uh, a valley disappearing or your water system uh, is being contaminated and, and, and now you have to force, you have been told, oh, no, no, go to the supermarket and buy a bottle of water. No, uh, the point is that you, you, can, you, can be, uh, you can get righteously angry. But the point then is that, that, that we need to show the ways forward. Now, you know, um, more pe some people have more time than others, others uh, and the innovative people are everywhere. And, and to give you an example about agriculture, UK, for example, um, uh, um, I mean, it, it, it is, it is um, almost symptomatic that you have one year, uh, a 25 year environmental plan being proposed. Then the next year you have a agriculture bill and then next year we will have the food bill. I mean, these are three unconnected exercises and, and you can therefore see the difficulty of coordinating uh, a coherent sort of uh, food and agriculture system, which can be linked up properly with policy. And, but now the point is that within all that, you know, um, uh, uh, individual, individual um, stakeholders uh, can still continue to, to, to move things forward in the right direction, provided we know what are those right direction. And the concrete example I want to give you is that 10 years ago, the whole of Britain was, was practicing um, heavily degrading agriculture. Today, we can say that 15% now of our agricultural land is under under controlled erosion, it is enhancing because we have now got farmers, farmers themselves, uh, driving this as they have driven the, this new agri throughout the world themselves, uh, including the, the other agroecology like, like via Campesina. A billion people are involved, the 250 household, farming households are involved in, in doing their part. They don't want to f follow the corporate uh, model. So here, even in the UK, and what has happened is that finally that, that uh, and we, we have been giving lectures to, to uh, government institutions, uh, research institutions who are supposed to, supposed to know all this. And if they do know it, they should supposed to generate better knowledge and how to apply it, uh, working with farmers. But uh, unfortunately, we've lost all that ability. Hopefully it'll come back. But here is conservation agriculture in the UK now, more or around 15% is already now under what I call a different track 
And I must thank some of my very close farmer friends like Tony Reynolds, the che John Cherry and Paul Cherry. They, they now run, run a, a, an annual show called Groundswell uh, Show. And they bring together all the farmers who are interested, come and see. We will demonstrate it. You will meet all kinds of things, new, new machinery, machinery companies. And finally, even the government now offers 40% subsidy to any farmer who wants to practice or share, move into no-till agriculture. So we can, but the point is that the evidence should be there and the farmers who, who are going to say, look, you, uh, we're going to go forward anyway. And we know how the, uh, this is the way forward. You can see it, come here and please try and now align, align yourself with, uh, with us uh, because this works uh, because what you've got at the moment is really destroying our national heritage. Same thing we've done at the European level in Brussels. We brought back uh, diversification and rotation uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a green practice for pillar one. Uh, and, and so, so we can, uh, but, but the overall change process is going to be uh, what I would say we need a, an ongoing process where institutions are all working together and especially we cannot underemphasize the role of education system uh, uh, that they really have a major role to play as well in the medium term. Uh, but we can do a lot in the immediate future as well. And, 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 the, and the social movements are, are already showing us that, that they don't uh, necessarily wait for some, uh, you know, big pharma or big, big uh, agrochemical company to give them some free gifts or promises. They... So um, a lot of people, both in the Q&A section and also um, social media and um, people who've emailed us have expressed interest in exploring, speaking at length about the question of animal agriculture in particular, regenerative grazing, you know, animal agriculture and the sustainability and ethical issues. Um, so, you know, I'll go back to that a little bit. I want to mention that, um, I hope he doesn't mind for me to mention this, but Ian, Ian Tolhurst uh, is on the Q&A right now. And he has been doing um, veganic farming in the UK for decades. Um, he is the author of Growing Green, I believe is the name of the book. Ian, please correct me in the comments if I got that wrong, but I believe that the name, the title of your book is Growing Green. So that's a book that people who want to read more about the specifics of veganic, or as he calls it, um, stock-free farming, if they want to read more about the specifics, you can buy that book and read about that. Um, you know, so obviously people can grow without animal inputs because we have people who have been doing it for a long time. Um, in the case of Ian, he also, you know, writes here that, um, you know, they have been producing ecological and biologically rich food systems that can flourish with virtually no external input. So it's not only a question of no animal inputs, but also no external inputs. Right. So Growing Green, that's the name of the book. And also Amir and Layla have an invitation to come and see his earthworms. Um, they have 13 million per hectare. The land has been growing vegetables continuously for 33 years with no animal input. So definitely there are plenty of examples of these sorts of projects. Um, so I want to bring up a question that somebody asked because the fact that we have these models does not mean that these models are readily talked about or that, you know, people in environmental, in the environmental food movement or food movement are necessarily interested in these models. So Corey is asking, what hope do you have that discussions of regenerative agriculture will shift away from animal agriculture? I guess, how can we create a shift in the people who are talking about regenerative agriculture? Can Shalala, shall yeah, yes, oh. Nassim, a very good question. I think we must first of all, re first of all realize that agriculture uh, is, a, is a, a lots of lots of activities in them, and uh, and um, and um, so uh, if you if you want to use the word uh, the term regenerative agriculture, 
uh, and say that, well, we, we practicing re regenerative agriculture, but we don't have animal. So it, 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 and and uh, to, to, to explain to people that that term doesn't automatically by default must force you to 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 uh, to have animals you know now there there are there this um, at the moment i mean i must admit uh, i was i was very surprised uh, two three years ago how so called uh, uh, the rotational uh, rotational grazing became went into mob grazing and and uh, and and then the, it was given a name of holistic grazing and and now it is being called regenerative grazing and uh, uh, and 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 uh, and giving it a name uh, is not is not going to enough uh, to be enough. Uh, we have to understand the, the the science behind it and the and the negative consequences of of the animal based regenerative agriculture. And now, if it is especially to stand alone, then you know it is basically occupying land, which could be used much better, more efficiently for much better uses uh, than, 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 than it would, would be doing now. And uh, uh, on the crop agriculture, I think I, I've uh, already mentioned several times and you've got farmers uh, who, are, who, are, who are doing, I mean, it, we're not only doing conservation agriculture, but they're doing organic conservation agriculture. You know, and, 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 and when they say organic, they don't rely on a, on a, on a, on a ruminant stomach somewhere or, or rely on, on bringing in a chicken manure or, 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 or poultry manure. They, they, they generate, they generate uh, uh, the, the, the new, uh, nutrition and productivity of the soil from the natural resources which, are, which have been, uh, which are available on the farm. Uh, and you then have to know what nature has already given us. The, the nature has given us uh, just about everything, but we have of course exhausted it to such a point and we've even lost sight of it that, that uh, you know, we've been doing it for last last uh, uh, 70 years. We've lost sight of what, how we used to farm in England, in, in the UK, uh, uh, at, during the war, we were, we were, uh, we, we were only using eight to nine kilograms of fertilizer per hectare. It, 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 it's no way, you know, and so, and, and I, um, yeah, so I think, um, and I have worked with thousands of farmers, uh, uh, especially small farmers who uh, don't have source of fertilizer. They can generate this so-called uh, uh, um, plant nutrients through the, through the, the natural processes, which, uh, which we are now, if there, if you need to supplement, uh, uh, like some of the old uh, societies, like the Chinampa people used to do, they would say, "Okay, well, we'll have in our in our farm uh, a diverse farm, and we'll have one part generating all the biomass we need, and and other farmers would say we will rotate it and all that, and so they would maintain, generate, and uh, consolidate, enhance. Uh, so I I think." Uh, I don't know whether I'm now um, laboring the point, uh, but it, it's, uh, so I, I think uh, um, uh, regenerative agriculture at the moment, it covers so many things. And, and unfortunately, I think people should, uh, should appreciate that ma many uh, activities, so-called regenerative agriculture are not properly defined. Mm. They, 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 they don't really, and, 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 the, and the place where you actually find something in terms of definition, it is conservation agriculture principles. The three principles of those, and then they've added, they've added uh, livestock, which, which as I said, it, it's it's a, it's a, it's a not a not an essential component of sustainable uh, farming, sustainable livelihood, uh, or, and, and certainly mm -hmm. not. So. Um, so that uh, Leila, you you want to? Yeah, no, I, I also wanted to say I I can't remember exactly the wording of the question, but it's kind of like how I, I remember thinking when when you asked it that we we need to raise awareness of these alter alternative models of agriculture which are regenerative and do not exploit animals, which is and and I think in the in the sort of animal justice movement we are not well educated on these. On these things so we can and, and in many movements the food movement is not aware so I don't know how regenerative agriculture has got such a big name um, you know so 
what seems to be in the last few years has become really prominent and environmental groups and food movement is talking about regenerative, regenerative. And I think we need an alternative and strong narrative um, to counter that, actually, not really to counter it. We need our own um, narrative and examples and raising awareness um, of you know, CA-based veganic agroecology, which is regenerative. CA is regenerative, organic CA is regenerative without the use of animals, um, you know, by default right. it's vegan, but... Um, we don't even have to call it organic. It doesn't have to be certified for supermarket. You could do it completely biologically. Yeah. And, and uh, there are thousands of farmers in Africa, for example, uh, are doing, doing it uh, uh, biologically. They, they, it doesn't have to be certified. In fact, some of the organic certification uh, it, it forces farmers to become no, uh, unsustainable because it's so commodity driven. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it, so, uh, so I think that even there, but, but uh, Nassim, the, 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 the key thing also here is that the power of consumers, the power of consumer, because they are so misinformed that they can't decide, and even a label uh, on a, on a, on a, on a package is so mis. Um, uh, it does, they can't understand, uh, interpret it. What does it mean now? So he tells me this much, and that one is, is that much. So, but they, it is very difficult to for them to because their the understanding uh, is not enough to make for them to take a position. And as long as you're not taking a position, able to take a position, you essentially haven't got enough. Uh, enough information for you to make a, a, a personal best decision. And, uh, but the point is that now the, 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 the farming industry is uh, going to see that as the public gets more and more informed about the, the, the negative consequences really never, of, of livestock on, on personal health and of course the environment as well, they, they, they are going to reduce the demand. And so let, let's face it, most of the farmers try to grow a livestock because it is, it is a high income generating for them. It, 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 they don't concern about how many indigenous communities they destroy or how much biodiversity is destroyed. Oh no, and they, they, they love to even join the shooting parties and go and ki kill more birds. And, and, and uh, remember in the UK, a lot of the area it's under so-called livestock agriculture is being being used for entertainment and 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 it is kept degraded so that they can shoot shoot uh, grouse and and uh, pheasants and in, including importing pheasants so they can shoot them because they fly at a, a better angle to, uh, to be to be shot at so i mean all those kinds of things uh, i think people will have to realize uh, that, that this is what happening to area under livestock and uh, and we could be um, converting them into 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 rewilding uh, project, projects, conservation projects, cultural projects, and uh, and sequestering more and more carbon and, and and getting healthier healthier air atmosphere back and regenerate that. So I I think uh, the power of consumer is so so potentially important. Uh, and and uh, Emma Thompson has said to the public, don't underestimate what you can do in terms of bringing about change. Uh, so, and, yeah. But if the farmers want to sell, if the public wants to eat all the time, meat, 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 then of course, I mean, that, 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 then they have to also understand the consequence of their decision. And, and, and that's where the ignorance is, 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 is not bliss anymore. You know, it is, it is harm, harmful, um, yeah. So if it's okay, I, oh no, if it's okay, I want to also take a stab at answering Corey's question. Um, oh, Leila, you seem confused. No, 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 I'm, I'm interested in the response okay. and also the question because it was such a long time ago. I forgot uh, so his question was, what hope do you have that discussions of regenerative agriculture will shift away from animal agriculture? And if that's okay, I wanted to also bring in my perspective um, from Seed the Commons, uh, because this really lands squarely in what Seed the Commons has been about, truly. Um, you know, the history of Seed the Commons was that I used to volunteer, I mean, I still did while I was also doing uh, Seed the Commons, but in any case, 
um, more than a decade ago, I used to volunteer a lot with Via Campesina and in other ways I was involved in, you know, various circles uh, of people who were, you know, somewhat progressive and, you know, these things that I was seeing how this was evolving and how these various movements and these various social trends were leading more and more to this discourse that we need animals and that farming animals is enlightened and so on. And so in the past, maybe, um, you know, five years, regenerative agriculture has become more explicitly the thing. But, um, you know, and it's interesting, just as a parenthesis, how you were talking about how all of these things are regenerative. Why don't they get that label? And it's interesting how what has gotten that label is actually very linked to the paleo idea, right? Which is that agriculture itself is the problem and growing crops itself is a problem. And so, uh, you know, people want these systems that are like perennials plus livestock, but that's a different thing. You know, that's a different conversation. Um, it, but in any case, in the past five years, it's been regenerative agriculture. But even before that, you know, when it was more, people were talking more about local food and agroecology and so on, it was the same thing that was happening where it was this idea that all of those ideals that we're putting forth about what the food system should look like was inherently dependent on animals you know, therefore veganism cannot work. And so what Seed the Commons um, decided to do about that was that instead of constantly running after every argument that people were making and seeking to debunk it, that we would put forth our own narrative. So when, when you ask Corey, what hope do you have that discussions of regenerative agriculture will shift away from animal agriculture? What we were doing was that we were saying, well, we're going to put ourselves and other vegans at the helm of the food movement. And therefore, we're going to decide on the discussions and we're going to take over the discussions. And so that's basically what we're trying to do today and in the next webinars and what we used to do with our People's Harvest Forum. And so um, the idea was not that these things would be catered to vegans, but rather that these things would be uh, alternatives to the other environmental conferences and so on that were happening um, and that they would be for this broader audience who was interested in regenerative agriculture and so on and that the people, the experts that we would bring on would be people like Amir or Ian, people who were uh, academics, who were farmers, who were gardeners, and who were vegan, and so they were showing their version of regenerative and so on. Um, and so that's really been our strategy, which is that we take a proactive approach instead of a reactive approach, and that we put forth a different um, narrative, and we, we now establish the parameters of the discussion within our ethical system. Um, and I have to say that that wasn't very successful with the vegans. I think that vegans are very much in this paradigm. I mean, it wasn't successful in the, fact, in the sense that people didn't really see the regenerative thing happening and they didn't understand why it was important to put forth veganics and to put forth an alternative. And it's really only, I feel like, in the past two years that the coin has kind of dropped with the vegan community. And now they're like, oh my God, we need to debunk the regenerative and please give me all the arguments. Um, and it's fine to look for the arguments to say, well, this doesn't make sense. But if that's your only strategy, in five years, there's going to be another argument. There's going to be another trend. And you're going to be running after that, trying to debunk that. And so for us, it was about let's just put forth um, our version of regenerative and our version of sustainable food systems, but within our ethic. And let's build platforms um, for the people who are already doing these things so that they can be, um, you know, the the ones you know at the forefront to show what what sustainability and and all these things look like what does regenerative farming look like and not for necessarily a vegan audience um you know it's not about talking to other vegans it's about being in the circles where we are talking about um you know climate issues and so on where we're talking about changing our food system but putting forth our own version of it Anyway, so I, I wanted to add that even though it's not my, you know, my webinar here, but that's very squarely on what See the Commons um, is about, really. Yeah. Nassim, one, one, one comment. The book, the, the book does try to highlight the, the controversies which, which uh, uh, the uh, nature of 
what, what the, the book has talk, so, talked about. And we also appreciate, uh, um, this, these are not like electric switch. They don't happen overnight, you know, and, uh, and many, many livelihoods, I think, uh, um, uh, we we know uh, many livelihoods, uh, uh, especially in the uh, with marginal communities and 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 pastoral communities, their livelihoods depend on. In fact, their survival depends on livestock. But we are we are we are certainly uh, 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 sympathetic to all those situations. But 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 then when you look at the the, the other uh, other um, parts of the world where where society really. It doesn't even know what to do with its wealth, you know. I think we uh, we, we have to show what show what you said that there are genuine alternatives, which is good for everybody. And then over time, as like it happened in Europe, uh, over time pastoralism uh, more or less died down as new opportunities uh, uh, arose and people moved into better opportunities. So uh, so uh, um, uh, uh, and if people just want to. Uh, to uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, eat meat for themselves. Uh, they cannot then have an argument that we must co-op livestock to to be sustainable. And and so so we we are not uh, trying to be fundamentalist here. We we are basically presenting a, a, a science-based and, and genuine sort of uh, doable uh, tested situations uh, which can be are being promoted and can be promoted further. Yeah. So there are several great questions still, and I, I don't want to ignore people. I will get to a couple more. I also want to acknowledge that we've been here for much longer than what was planned. Um, and I know that some people are already leaving. I know that the panelists are tired. Um, I would invite you all to, you know, attend our next webinars. Um, the next scheduled one is uh, October 30th. We probably won't do something next week, but if we do, it will go out in the newsletter, but there's one planned for October 30th on grazing um, in the West, the wildfires and so on. Um, I want to, though, you know, if I can maybe get to one or two more questions. Um, you know, and in the meantime, I also want to invite you guys again uh, to, um, uh, you know, follow us on the newsletter and make a donation if you can so that we can do these sorts of things. All right, so this is a, a pretty straightforward question. Um, which academic institutions in the UK or Europe do you think have the most progressive researchers and departments that are open to a vegan plant-based agricultural paradigm and conducting relevant research? So, so we, uh, which university in the UK is, is offering what? So in the UK or Europe, um, who has the most progressive researchers and departments who might be open to vegan, um, you know, agricultural paradigms and are conducting and or I guess are re conducting relevant research? I, I think, I, I mean, I would like to hear a question like that in terms of not just vegan agriculture, but but uh, because what is vegan agriculture? Unless you say well, because you you could you could uh, be doing uh, intensive tilled vegan agriculture. Vegan agriculture is agriculture which does not rely on animal, and hopefully it is uh, meeting the demands of uh, uh, people with vegan diet. But that is that doesn't guarantee sustainability. So I think that the, the person who has asked this question must must add uh, add one or two other terms. Uh, to to uh, so you, said, you could certainly say uh, vegan part sort of uh, caters for the food side and the health side, but the agriculture part. You know, so I think you, you need to add sustainable vegan agriculture. And if if you're already very uh, knowledgeable, then you could say uh, sustainable vegan agriculture based on conservation agriculture. Uh, and then then you you're beginning to. Uh, to uh, present uh, a question, which which is then really one could one could elaborate uh, in a, in, a, in a very uh, what you call it useful manner. So uh, so I will I, I, which uh, university or institutions in the UK offer uh, um, courses on on this or research? Unfortunately, there isn't a single farm, campus farm in in the UK, for example, which is based on conservation agriculture, let alone uh, trying to, to, to uh, show what is sustainable agriculture, uh, which, is, which is veganic 
uh, in its in in its principles as well. So uh, so I'm afraid the answer is very gloomy, very gloomy. Uh, I, uh, I teach. Uh, uh, conservation agriculture and, and, and in fact I teach a course, we used to teach a full course on rethinking agriculture, food and agri uh, agricultural development, implementing solutions and, uh, and I used to tell my students when you leave my course you will be able to get a job because you will be able to talk sense uh, uh, in your interview and they will realize that you actually know what, is, what can be done at the action level. So unfortunately, we're generating students who, who, are, who, are, who are just as confused when they came in. They're more confused when they leave. Uh, and, the, and the university campus farms, which would be the, the, uh, the field laboratories, and none of them, as far as I can see, none of them are run on, uh, on not only veganic basis, but let alone on, on, they are not run on, they are, they are classical, classical, intensive, high agrochemical input uh, uh, production systems. That's what they what they run on. Uh, most of the campuses are supported by the corporate sector. Uh, they give them vast amount of money on robotics, on uh, on um, all kinds of things. And most of them have a strong livestock livestock uh, uh, program, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and that's what uh, has been inherited. And now. Um, uh, yeah, so it's it's um, it's going to be, uh, but so the change will come sudden, so more suddenly in the education system, uh, uh, because uh, they will they will eventually will be will be uh, will see uh, more and more demands being placed upon them and and questioned because students are now paying paying for their courses, so they are more uh, discerning about the quality of the type and the quality of of courses they can get, they can receive and uh, and I so uh, but uh, the situation is very 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 bad in our education system all over the world so, yeah but I, but I can give you the names of universities uh, the Earth University in Costa Rica but even there it is heavily on tillage base but Cordoba University in Spain is fully fully on a sustainable system. It does, it, uh, it, it, um, uh, but it does not run a veganic version, it, but it runs, a, and it, if there was no animal, it would not suffer at all in terms of sustainability, ecological sustainability. Um, there are other, others, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I might add something to that, uh, even though it's not about, um, what happened here? Uh, even though it's not about, um, the UK and Europe, which I, I don't, you know, know about very much. Um, but I will say that our experience with Seed the Commons, um, you know, I've done a few interviews with veganic farmers and I've interacted with many veganic farmers, inviting them to things. And, um, and then we've partnered with this uh, um, academic in Southern California who she has been researching veganic farms in North America and really one of the main things that came out of all of this for us that was very clear was that there was a complete lack of just education for veganic farmers. Um, so they were, I mean, as Amir said, you know, most of the universities are really pushing a corporate model. So that's one problem. And then the other problem is that even in the spaces that are, you know, training, for example, organic farmers, um, they're just teaching them to use animal inputs. And so there's really in North America, complete absence of any kind of I mean, in terms of research specifically, I know two people in the United States who are conducting research on veganic farms. Um, they're working together, so it's, you know, one research team. And then in terms of offering education, I don't know of any, and that's something, you know, a problem that's been identified. And I think that this, those who are in the system can you know, try to address it within the system. Uh, but in addition to that, I think that the way that we need to address this kind of links up to what I was saying earlier about putting forth our own narratives and putting ourselves at the helm of the movement. And so we can do the same thing, not only in terms of conferences and activism and, you know, so on, but also in terms of educational opportunities and create 
our own educational opportunities, perhaps farmer to farmer and so on, because there is definitely an absolute lack in that sense. And I think that, you know, this is an opportunity maybe to take some inspiration from Via Campesina, where they've created these, um, I can't remember the exact word, but they have these farmer to farmer agroecology schools where I think, for example, in Nicaragua, there's one. And so farmers from other countries will all go there and they'll be trained in agroecological agro methods. And so, uh, you know, that's maybe the thing that needs to happen with veganics now, a more grassroots model, which would also make it easier to keep out the, you know, synthetic fertilizers and so on, right, if it, if it didn't have those um, financial attaches. Um, so I think I'll just, it's, it's late, and I think I'll just close with one question, um, if that's okay with, with you guys. Uh, so we'll just end with this question, and then everything else will be for future webinars. Um, all no-till agriculture is heavily dependent on Roundup. This is not inclusively responsibility, uh, responsible. Sorry. Uh, how are these farmers... Um, to manage without any chemicals. That, that's a, that's a very very good uh, very good question, uh, and you could ask uh, similar questions about the industrial agriculture. How can you do it without this and without that? And uh, and and uh, and weeds um, weeds um, uh, are are of particular interest. Uh, by the by the way. Uh, um, um, we uh, we're talking about conservation agriculture and not no-till uh, roundup GMO-based agriculture. That's uh, that's another thing which uh, w which I can talk about it uh, uh, for days. But but no, uh, when you when you practice conservation agriculture, then you realize immediately that you essentially have the power of practicing integrated weed management, integrated weed management. And that is that you uh, can uh, bring in, first of all, uh, not, not plowing or not tilling the soil already is a step in the right direction to reduce your, your uh, herbicide use. It could be Roundup, it could be other, other herbicides. Uh, uh, because the minute you stop uh, protect, protecting the weed seed, you leave them in the ground, they start rotting. If you bring them if you bury them again from the top back in there, then there you, you're helping them to survive. And the seeds at the top are, are gonna be eaten up by ants and, and birds and all that. Then you start covering the soil and you have got a layer of biomass. I'm just explaining how it is possible and how it is then done actually by small farmers and, and, and larger farmers. When you start putting biomass, it starts smothering uh, the weeds uh, and uh, uh, and also as the as the organic matter starts decomposing, it it releases organic acids, and so they begin to to kill weed seeds as well. So every year you start losing some twenty percent of your seeds, and within five years, you find that you are basically moved into almost a, a, a weed-free environment. Uh, right now, then you have the crop diversification. And the power of crop diversification is well known in terms of uh, uh, not just weed infestation, but also breaking um, uh, other pest, insect pest cycles and so forth. So, so here you got a system which is very powerful, has powerful components. And now if you are a small farmer, small farmer, then you will use in that, for example, crop uh, uh, diversification, an association which will smother the, 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 the ground uh, and, the, and the weeds. Uh, for example, a maize associated with uh, a, a crop like uh, uh, a pumpkin or even uh, a, we, uh, be a multi-purpose bean crop like uh, dolichos, uh, sorry, lab lab uh, uh, would, would, uh, would uh, basically would not require you to apply herbicide. Moving to a larger farm uh, or medium size, or even uh, Paraguay, for example, Paraguay has got three million hectares, hectares of uh, no-till agriculture with smaller, small, and half of those, uh, sorry, seventy percent are small farmers. Half of them don't even have make, uh, um, equipment. They 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 have uh, um, animal uh, power in uh, to do their operation. But you know what they, they did, and this is going back 25 years ago, and which is now becoming 
more and more appreciated and they would use a, a roller crimper. So you could harvest one crop and then come and pass over that with a roller crimper and you squash the, 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 uh, the, st uh, the vegetation and you then come and directly seed into that uh, squash vegetation with your new seed. And, and, uh, and, and so there's, there would be no need for uh, uh, herbicide. Now, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, the easiest way out is, well, you give it a, a, a quick uh, uh, dose of uh, uh, glyphosate to burn that vegetation quickly. And I can tell you that uh, tillage agriculture, tillage farmers not only destroy the soil, but they use more uh, herbicide than no-till farmers. And so you, here is a case where the, the, the tillage doesn't really help them. They think it's eradicating or reducing their weed. But on the, on the, sea, on the no till farmers, uh, you have practice which is now called planting green and good reset. Now you see here, here comes the, 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 uh, the issue. Who is going to do the research on, on, on these things? Now, Pennsylvania University in America has done very good research recently, and now is coming up with ways forward on planting green so that a farmer can switch from one crop to the next without using any herbicide. But, you know, and, uh, and research funding is always important if you, for, if you establish these institutions with overheads and all that. So the other, other lovely, lovely, lovely uh, practice is a push-pull system, which of course uh, is practiced in Africa and, and really has a solid science uh, basis to it. And for example, in, um, yeah, anyway, so I think there are many examples where you, you can uh, try and minimize uh, uh, glyphosate or Roundup or any other that as, as in general, no-till farmers practicing conservation agriculture have done. Even in the UK, they would use half a liter or a liter per hectare of the so-called Roundup formulation compared to double, treble the amount which is used by, by, by uh, uh, other uh, the tillage farmers. Now, of course, uh, the GMO farmers and all that, they really, that, that really should be, that's a corporate world. And, and I think, you know, we should uh, uh, absolutely uh, criticize this vast amount of uh, um, Roundup being used and a lot of it aerially sprayed, which really shouldn't, shouldn't be allowed. And uh, so, but good quality conservation agriculture, you can practice, uh, uh, if you're smart. And in, in areas where there is seasonality, you know, you're starting with a clean, clean uh, sea, uh, 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 field anyway, like in Syria, for example, at the moment, I, I work in Syria, have worked in, in, in for many years. And, and, uh, and especially in the last uh, few years, it's very difficult to get input, but they, they will seed dry before the, the rains come. And I was there last December and they, they said, we, we, that's the way we, we do it. Uh, we just was outsmart the weeds, get going before that. And of course there is a higher risk of crop establishment failure, but that's better than because we don't have anything else and uh, uh, we don't even have fuel to, to, to run our machines. So, so um, there are, and then of course the, the beautiful research work happening now, absolutely beautiful. Again, you know, we have to get the right researchers with, with so, so funny. Uh, man manipulating the ratios of fungi versus bacteria in the soil. That, uh, that uh, uh, you, uh, if you keep the ratios more towards fungi, they, they knock the, the hell out of the weeds. And uh, you know, fungi will eat up, uh, uh, you know, organic matter in the soil, they rely on that. And so, so they have a, uh, they have a knock, knock uh, on effect on weeds. Uh, and, uh, and so here are possibilities. That one is a possibility from Kansas University and, and uh, <laughs> uh, they, they call it part of, re they want to you know, include it in the regenerative agriculture. I would be all for it <laughs> because the good part, the good part of regenerative agriculture, they want to basically uh, create biological based uh, uh, ecologically sustainable farming. So there is no problem on that side. Uh, and uh, so there is another, another. So I can give you many, many examples uh, which uh, can reduce and avoid. And remember, if you are doing it with manual system, 
please, you know, remember that, that you are already better off with CA and your, your weeding time and your uh, <laughs> uh, soil killing time is reduced by more than 50%. And, and, and so you've got uh, still spare at that time to um, weed manually because the weeds are going down, uh, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's much, much uh, uh, less strenuous and also uh, uh, less time you, uh, to do it. Uh, and so, um, uh, and I think we should hear from, more directly from farmers who are able to practice uh, on, a, on a larger scale farming without, without uh, uh, Roundup Ready. And I have worked without Roundup Ready with many, many, many farmers. Uh, and and uh, I explain it to them, show it to them, and they do it. All right, I think it's time for us to end the webinar. If there are topics that you feel um, we didn't cover sufficiently or you'd like for us to cover, just you can email info at seedthecommons.org. And so we can um, take that feedback for future webinars. Um, there were a couple resources I wanted to mention earlier and I forgot. I just wanted to say that um, on, we have a website that is veganic.world. And if you go on that website, it's a website in progress. If anybody wants to help create content and so on for that website, please email me. But in any case, at this point, we have a map on the website of veganic farms uh, in North America. So it's, um, it started out in the US and now the researchers adding farms also in Canada and Mexico. So there is that resource to at least kind of visualize who is doing what where. And then I recently saw that there's a similar map for Europe. I don't know the website, but I saw someone post that just recently, I think in the past week, I saw someone post that on um, the Facebook page, Vegan Organic Network. And so if you go there, you can probably find that map of veganic farms in Europe. So those might be two useful resources for people. Um, so, all right, so I want to end this webinar. I really am grateful both to Amir and Leila for joining me on World Food Day, and I'm grateful for everybody who's attending the webinar. Um, I want to mention that the editors, in addition to the book, have created a website that has extracts of all the different chapters, as well as summaries of the key ideas. And so, and I think that the website is live now. And so if you'd like to explore some of these topics more, you can go to inclusiveresponsibility.earth. So inclusiveresponsibility.earth, and you'll find more uh, detail about all the different chapters, all the different ideas, and I think um, information to order the book. And also if you wanna order the book, if you just go on the Zoom re uh, registration page, there's a link to that directly there. Um, and again, we appreciate if you can make donations to support the, this webinar and future webinars. Um, in terms of future webinars, we have one scheduled for October 30th at the same time, where we're going to be speaking um, more uh, in depth about the situation on the West Coast um, of the United States with the wildfires that we've been having and how that, you know, how that links up to climate change and what are the agricultural drivers, as well as discuss a bit the agricultural solutions, including is grazing really the solution to solving this problem? Um, all right, so thank you so much. I don't know if you guys wanted to say anything quickly before we end or no? Well, I, I just want to say thank you, Nassim, and thank you to everyone who's managed to sit through this like two and plus hours. Um, and also to Ian Tolhurst that we would be very, very um, happy to come and visit your farm. And we'd, yeah, really, we were talking about um, you, you know, your farm uh, quite recently, actually. So um, thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, and I would also uh, add my sincere thanks to to Nassim and to all the all the people in the audience. Uh, uh, this is uh, such an important event, uh, and I just hope that this uh, grows into more and more important event, and we start understanding our challenge, the, the huge burden of challenges that we're carrying now. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Most grateful. All right, thank you again, and bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. And adios. <laughs>